Good morning and welcome to worship at St. James on this eighth Sunday after the festival of Pentecost. Today we hear dual themes. We hear a theme of Jesus as good shepherd and we also hear the theme of God as the builder. But before we move ahead, let us begin with reality, begin with words of confession and forgiveness printed before you. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Amen. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us now confess our sin. God, our provider, Beloved people of God, in Jesus, the manna from heaven, you are fed and nourished. By Jesus, the worker of miracles, there is always more than enough. And through Jesus, the bread of life, you are shown God's mercy. Together we are forgiven and loved into abundant life.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. O God, powerful and compassionate, you shepherd your people, faithfully feeding and protecting us. Heal each of us and make us into a whole people that we may embody the justice and peace of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. The first reading is from Jeremiah, the 23rd chapter. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore thus, says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who shepherd my people, it is you who have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. So I will attend to you for your evil doings, says the Lord. Then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the lands where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will raise up shepherds over them who will shepherd them, and they shall not fear any longer or be dismayed, nor shall any be missing, says the Lord. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, And he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will live in safety. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Word of God, word of life.
The second reading is from Ephesians, the second chapter. Remember that at one time, you Gentiles by birth, called the uncircumcision, by those who are called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall. That is the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to you those who were near. For through him both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints, and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. Word of God, Word of Life. The Holy Gospel according to Mark. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. They went away in a boat to a deserted place by themselves. 
Now many saw them going and recognized them. They hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored the boat. When they had got out of the boat, the people at once recognized him and rushed about the whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. The Gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. From our second reading today that Allison read for us a moment ago, these few words. So then you are no longer strangers or aliens, but members of the household of God, built on the foundation of apostles and prophets, with Christ himself as the cornerstone. You are being built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. Here ends the text. Dear Ask the Builder columnist, I have an old house in need of expensive renovation. Should I repair it or tear it down and rebuild new? Signed, Confused Homeowner. Well, actually, Tim Carver is the Ask the Builder columnist, has been in the papers for some 25 years. You remember newspapers, don't you? Actually, how would you answer that question? Should we tear down the old house? Or shall we renovate it? And for that matter, what would God's advice be? After all, we, according to Scripture, are temples of the Holy Spirit. God lives in us. So should God remodel us and throw a little paint on the wall and clean us up? Or should God tear us down to the studs and start over? Should God simply send in the demolition team? What would God's advice be for us? Thirty years after Jesus' death and resurrection, as I mentioned in last week's sermon, a follower of Christ wrote a letter to the church in Ephesus claiming that God is in the midst of a construction project and you are that project. God is the building contractor. God is busy making you and me into a new residence. And someone is planning on moving in. And who is that? Well, it's God, after all. God intends to live in you. God is living in you. So tell me, with a God living in you, is that good news? Or is that frightening news? Would it surprise you to know that last year alone, 1.3 million new homes were built in the United States? New construction from the ground up, privately owned. And at the very same time last year, millions of homes were being renovated, spending a total of $420 billion. People adding a room, expanding a space, remodeling their residence. So what is God actively doing in you spiritually today? Renovating or tearing down? And while we're at it, how are you and I using our carpentry skills, especially with others? Are we building others up or are we tearing them down? As I look at our society today, I must admit that I personally have difficulty with people who seem to be very specific and very articulate about the things that should be destroyed in our society, but have no ideas and no interest 
about how to rebuild new. They fill the airwaves with what is wrong with our country, our city, our borders, those other people. They can give you chapter and verse on why we should just burn it all down. But they provide no hope, no solutions, no helpful remedies. They remind me that I can very well take a sledgehammer to my kitchen at home and I can do a bang-up job. I really can. But it's all craziness. Unless I am willing to pay a skilled carpenter to create out of it a usable, workable, attractive kitchen to replace it. Sledgehammers alone just make an awful mess. You and I, I suspect, can give 80 examples off the top of our head about people in our society, or phrases in our society about just tearing it all down. Defund the police. Go back to where you came from. The claim of a fraudulent election. Just shut down the Tokyo Olympics. Get rid of those homeless people. The vaccine can't be trusted. Don't take it. Those aren't answers. Those don't build up anything. And it isn't just those people out there. We who are followers of Jesus the Christ are called to do more than tear down. We're called to stop pretending that it's someone else's job to build up, to replace, to rebuild. It's our job to offer solutions and creative ideas. Jennifer Rubin wrote recently about us, about Christians, about how some of us who use the label Christian just want to tear it all down. I quote, Our politics have fallen victim to the primal scream of once dominant white evangelicals. Having failed to capture the hearts, minds, and souls of a majority of Americans, these communities are turning against democracy. They prefer an authoritarian theocracy to a multiracial society, end of quote. Followers of Christ, like us, as Jesus said, need to take a little time now and then to make sure we're not just complaining about the speck that's in our brother's eye and recognize the log that's in our own. After all, Jesus is the one who spent more time ushering in the new kingdom of God rather than stamping out the old one. So perhaps, what are we doing to build up hope in our society? Lifting up solutions, providing creative answers. Lord knows from the Ephesian text we're told that we are built on a foundation of apostles and prophets. Christ Himself is the cornerstone. We have the support. So what are we doing? Well, according to today's reading, the answer has something to do with building expansion. We take our spiritual home and actively add on a room called love. We add a more welcome entryway. We repurpose the extra bedroom into a place of hope. We are always under construction. God is building us so that we can be a dwelling place for God. And as one theologian said, it's a messy ordeal because the gospel is always bad news before it's good news. Maybe that's why we began our service today with words of confession and forgiveness because we need to admit that it gets messy sometimes. There's a story of a castle in Ireland, an architectural gem of the Emerald Isles. The structure was falling into disrepair and finally all the occupants left the castle. As often happens, the locals were scavenging for stones and little by little the castle was in danger of being, of being disturbed and dismantled. 
One day, Lord Londonbury, the sole heir of the Irish castle, came to visit. He saw what was happening to his beloved castle, and he ordered his agents to build a six-foot-high wall around the entire castle. And then he left. Surely, he thought, that will protect the property. Three years later, he returned. There, he saw, just as he had ordered, a beautiful six-foot-high wall around the entire property. And as he looked over the top of it, he noticed something. There was no castle. The castle had vanished. What happened to the castle, he asked his agents. Well, the agents replied, you certainly didn't want us to go all over Ireland looking for stones when the best stones in the world were right there in the castle. They'd torn down the castle in order to build a wall. People of God, sometimes we forget our purpose. God lives in us. We are a dwelling place for God. And the gospel invites us to spend a little less time building walls and a little more time adding on a room called love. Through Christ our Lord, amen.
Let us come before God in prayer. Tend your church, O God, and build us up to be a dwelling place for you. Embolden all the baptized to embody your love and justice, Lord, in your mercy. Restore your creation, O God. Sustain croplands and pastures and safeguard all farm animals and livestock. Preserve lakes, rivers, and streams that offer refreshment. Revive lands, recovering from natural disasters, especially as we think of the wildfires ablaze, especially in southern Oregon, and the flooding that has occurred in Europe. Lord, in your mercy. Reconcile the nations, O God. Break down the dividing walls that make us strangers to one another and unite us into one human family. Equip leaders to deal wisely with conflicts in, in Haiti, in Yemen, in Syria, in Ethiopia, and wherever there is strife. Lord, in your mercy. Heal your people, O God. Heal relationships and marriages and friendships. Look with compassion on immigrants, exiles, and all who are afraid or feel lost. Give rest to those who are weary, comfort to those who are grieving, and recovery to those who are ill, especially this day, Bill, Dennis, Vicki, Joyce, and all who suffer from the pandemic worldwide. Lord, in your mercy. Yes. Holy One, you lead us home. We give thanks for all who have died, now citizens with the saints. Especially we pray for Bill at the death of Bonnie, and ask that you would abide with Jean at the death of her son. As you have received them into your heavenly home, so welcome all who will dwell in your house forever. Lord, in your mercy. All these things, and whatever else you see that we need, grant to us for the sake of him who died and rose again, Jesus the Christ. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let's acknowledge one another with a sign of peace. Please be seated. Once again, a warm welcome to all of you on this summer's day. We have people visiting with us from uh, Colorado and Chicago and other areas of the country. We say welcome to all of you. Our prayers continue to be with Bill Hammond, who is still up at Veterans Hospital, but now we'll move to the VA Rehab Center in Vancouver as early as this week. Our thanks to all who have participated in the summer Bible study, the July Bible study. You can get it online. And this Wednesday, you will hear the voice of Matthew Schobert of our congregation sitting right over there, and he will share some of his thoughts about how the creeds are so fundamental in his life. Next Sunday, we gather for our namesake day. It is St. James Day here, and we will have the installation of our organist, Colin, and we will say farewell and Godspeed to our receptionist, Lily. And as we do so, we welcome to the front desk Ilsa Doherty, who is one of our choral scholars, and she will now be sitting at our front desk. Congratulations to her. I want to say a word of thanks to Sue McBerry of our congregation. She has brought us to another full year of contemplative prayer on Saturday mornings. And now we will pause for the month of uh, August and begin again in September. My thanks to her for her skill 
and her wisdom in helping us abide with God in contemplative prayer. I invite you now to prepare for the gift of Holy Communion by taking the elements before you and removing the strip that reveals the bread, even as you hear these beautiful words sung. Please remain seated. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you. Almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven. We praise your name and join their unending
Remembering our Lord's death and resurrection, we pray over this bread and cup, giving you thanks that you have made us worthy to stand before you and to serve you as your priestly people. Send your Spirit upon these gifts of your church. Gather into one all who share this meal. Fill us with your Holy Spirit to establish our faith in truth that we may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus the Christ, through whom all glory and honor are yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church both now and forever. Please lift the bread. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night of His betrayal, took bread. He gave thanks and broke it and gave it to His disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is My body given for you. Do this in remembrance of Me. The body of Christ given for you. Please lift the cup. In the same manner also he took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. It is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in my remembrance. The blood of Christ shed for you. Lord, remember us now in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of God and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, power, and glory are yours. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace today and into eternal life. Receive the blessing. The blessing of God who provides us, feeds us, and journeys with us. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, abide with you now and forever.
Go in peace. You are the body of Christ.